सर्वोपनिषदो गावो दुग्धागोपाल नंदन पार्थो वत्स सुधीर्भोक्ता दुग्धम गीतामृत महत Thank you again to everyone for joining us in this 17th lecture in the Srimad Bhagavad Gita lecture series. As we continue in chapter 4, at the beginning of chapter 4 we learned last time that Sri Krishna Bhagwan tells Arjun that you and I have been here infinite times. You don't remember your previous births, but I never forget. And then Bhagwan says, "Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. Abhyutanam adharmasya tadatmanam srojamyaham." Every time there is a need to re-establish dharma, meaning yoga on this earth, the connection to God on this earth, Bhagwan takes another avatar. He comes onto this earth. And as soon as Bhagwan explains to Arjun that God himself, Krishna Bhagwan himself comes onto this earth, he makes a clarification immediately in the ninth chapter, in the ninth couplet of the Shrimad Bhagavad Gita's fourth chapter. Krishna Bhagwan says, "Janma karma che me divyam" एवं योवेति तत्वतः त्यक्वा देहम पुनर्जन्म नैति मामेति सोर्जुन इन अ फ्यू श्लोक्स लेटर इन द 14th श्लोक भगवान आल्सो सेज नमाम कर्माणि लिम्पन्ति नमे कर्म फले स्पृहा इति माम यो बिजानाति कर्म भिर न सबद्यते भगवान टेल्स अर्जुन दैट माय बर्थ एंड ऑल ऑफ माय एक्शंस आफ्टर आई वाज बोर्न एवरी वन ऑफ माय कर्म they're all divine and he who understands this completely veti tatvatah the person who understands this completely about me when they pass away they are never reborn again then they attain permanent liberation you and me we're born because of our past karmas as we said in a previous lecture bharat ji in his next life was born as a deer that's because while he was bharat ji the karma he committed the sins of attaching himself completely to a deer instead of god that sin caused him to be reborn in his next life as a deer you and me wherever we're born whatever body we have all of that is based on all of our infinite past births all of the karma good and bad put together that's why we are where we are today but it's not like that for bhagwan He has no karma and he has never had karma and he never will have any karma attached to him. So his birth no matter where it took place or how it took place is always divine. Krishna Bhagwan was born to a mother and a father in the normal way any other child would be born. But it's still divine. He was born in a jail, but it's still divine. He was born at midnight, but it's still divine. Regardless of any other impact on what we would think would make it seem like he was a human. It's not like that. He has no karma attached to him. Now, it's also important to remember two other words in this shlok, veti tatvatah. We'll get to them later on. But Krishna Bhagwan also says in this shlok, not just his birth, but every action that comes afterwards, there is no karma that attaches to him. Everything he does is divine. We have to remember this. Sometimes we might have divya bhav we might be able to see the divinity in just one part of bhagwan's life but not the rest of it for example there's a story from the shrimad bhagwat brahma ji had full divinity and saw full divinity in god the moment he was born when krishna bhagwan was born onto this earth brahma ji came onto this earth along with him and he prayed to him he praised him he honored him with a stuti eventually brahma ji went back to his home in satyalok and he thought to himself how amazing is it that krishna bhagwan god himself has come down onto this earth and he had a thought in his mind a wish that i want to take some of the divine sanctified leftover food from bhagwan's hands prasad now there are two different stories associated with this the first a short story brahma ji he wishes to take some of the prasad sanctified leftovers from bhagwan's hand so he takes the form of a fish and waits inside of a nearby lake Krishna Bhagwan eats and Brahma ji is waiting for the moment when Krishna Bhagwan will come to the nearby lake and wash his hands the food that separated from his hands as a fish Brahma ji would eat it and he would feel fulfilled knowing that he had some of the divine prasad left over from Bhagwan but that day for whatever reason 
Bhagwan ate and then he wiped his hands on his pants. And Brahmaji thought to himself, Is this God? He doesn't even have the simple manners to wash his hands. And with that, Brahmaji felt that he is no longer God or he must not be God. He must never have been God. I must be wrong. This must just be like anyone else. That's one story. Another version of this story, slightly different in another recension, is that Brahmaji wanted some of the divine prasad, leftover remnants of food from Bhagwan's hands. Now at that time, Bhagwan and a group of his 15 other friends, they would play together every day. All of the friends had a rule amongst themselves that every day one of the friends brings food for everyone and they share that food amongst everyone equally. Amongst the group of friends was a small boy named Madhu Mangal. Madhu Mangal was incredibly poor. Every day, when another person, another boy would bring the food, they would share the food equally amongst all of the other boys. Krishna Bhagwan would take his food, his portion, take some of it off and give it to Madhu Mangal. That way, Madhu Mangal would get a little bit of a greater portion than just everyone else's equal share. And also, Madhu Mangal would get prasad every day. Eventually, Madhu Mangal's turn got closer and closer. He went home and he told his mother that in four days, it's my turn to take food for 15 of my other friends. What am I going to take? And his mother knew that we're so poor, how am I going to provide food for 15 other people? So she lessened her own food on a daily basis. When his turn came, the night before, Madhu Mangal told his mother that tomorrow I have to take food. I have to feed all of my other friends and I have to feed Bhagwan. What am I going to take? And the mother was worried. The mother said to her son that even tonight, I don't know what I'm going to feed you. Tonight, we don't have food to eat. So right now, go to sleep and I'll do what I can. That night, Madhu Mangal's mother had to send her son to sleep without eating. Now, any parent would sacrifice his or her own food to feed their child. Imagine how poor they were that the parents can't even feed their own child. The mental pain that this caused her mother was incredible. At night, she thought, what will I give my son so that, she can f- so that my son can feed Bhagwan?" The next morning, Madhu Mangal woke up and he asked his mother again, what will we give to Bhagwan?" Mother said, I didn't have food to feed you last night. I have nothing to give you this morning. It's a question about what I'll give you this afternoon. How can I give you food for 15 other people? Madhu Mangal said that anything that's possible, please find it, make it, let's do something. The mother said, give me a moment. She went to her neighbor and she asked her neighbor if she has anything left over from at any time during the week that she could give her child to eat and to share amongst his friends. And her neighbor gave her two-day-old buttermilk. That buttermilk had been sitting in the sun for two days. It was acidic. It had become incredibly sour and tart. But there was no other option. Mother gave it to Madhu Mangal and said, Take this buttermilk, chash. Take it, share it amongst your friends. Now Madhu Mangal, he started walking to meet Krishna Bhagwan and all of the other friends. But he hadn't eaten the night before. He hadn't had anything for breakfast. He was incredibly hungry. He was worried if he'll even make it to the games. Krishna Bhagwan is all-knowing. He knew that Madhu Mangal wants to reach here so that he can give me this buttermilk. He wants this just to feed me. But I don't think he'll make it to me. At one point, Madhu Mangal was so hungry, he couldn't control himself anymore. He sat down cross-legged on the ground and he was about to drink the buttermilk himself. Krishna Bhagwan ran towards him and then immediately changed his form so that he became semi-transparent. Madhu Mangal didn't even see him Krishna Bhagwan ran towards him and sat in Madhu Mangal's lap. And as Madhu Mangal turned the buttermilk up towards his mouth, he drank it so fast that some of it started to spill on the other sides of his mouth. And Krishna Bhagwan, to accept Madhu Mangal's devotion, to find a way to accept Madhu Mangal's bhakti, Krishna Bhagwan sat underneath Madhu Mangal's mouth and opened his mouth. And he drank some of the buttermilk that was flying outside of Madhu Mangal's mouth. And Brahmaji saw all of this from Satyalok. And he thought to himself, this is Bhagwan. This is what he does? He's ready to drink dirty buttermilk from the mouth of a shepherd's boy? This can't be Bhagwan. There is no way that this can be God. I came down years ago and praised him at his birth. At that time he seemed divine, but now I realize it's not like that. 
he had what's called mo. He saw God's actions and he couldn't understand them. He saw God's actions and thought that God must be incredibly hungry and couldn't control himself. He didn't realize that God was doing all of this, going out of his way to accept Madhu Mangal's devotion. And Brahmaji at that point decided to test whether or not Krishna was truly Bhagwan. So before Bhagwan went back to play games with Madhu Mangal and all the other friends, Brahmaji reached there. And he took all of the boys from Vraj and all of the cows from Vraj and took all of them to Satyalok. As soon as Krishna Bhagwan reached the place where they all played games, he realized that all of these boys have disappeared. He knew, being all knowing, that they've all gone to Satyalok. So in an instant, Krishna Bhagwan took an extra form, not one, not two, but he did a wish. Ekoham Bahusyam. I am one. May I become many. And as many boys that as Brahmaji had taken to Satyalok, and as many cows as Brahmaji had taken to Satyalok, Bhagwan Sri Krishna took the form of every boy and every cow in Vraj. And he lived with every family. And he stayed in every place for one year. Now, to the discerning eye, a person who is an expert can tell the difference between an original and a photocopy. But Krishna Bhagwan was so good at behaving as every child and behaving as every cow that no one was able to tell the difference. And eventually, every mother and every father, they thought they were showing love to their child, but they started to feel a separate, a different divine experience in their heart. Because the love they were showing to their child was actually being expressed towards Bhagwan. This is how we live in this world. Within every child, within every animal, within everyone around us, if we see God and we show our love towards that God, then that love, that same love which can cause us attachment to this world, can actually liberate us from this world. For one year, Krishna Bhagwan stayed as every child and as every cow within Vraj. After one year, Brahmaji realized that this must be Bhagwan. There's no other way that such a miracle could take place. Another incident that shows us just how divine Krishna Bhagwan is happens towards the end of the Mahabharata war. Towards the end of the Mahabharata war, Ashwatthama fires a Brahmastra with the intention of destroying everyone in the Pandav army. He himself doesn't completely realize the gravity of using the Brahmastra. Ved Vyas, Naradji, they have to arrive on the scene and they have to tell Ashwatthama that this weapon is so powerful, it won't just kill everyone in the Pandav army, it will kill everyone in the world, including you. Ashwatthama realizes his mistake, but because he's a sinner, he's unable to control the Brahmastra. Krishna Bhagwan gives him some middle ground. He says, you need to withdraw it, redirect it to something else. Something that doesn't exist in the world currently. That way, the world will be saved. Ashwatthama still has a lot of enmity against the Pandavas. He still wants to take revenge against the Pandavas. So instead of trying to kill anyone who's alive in the world at the time, he makes a wish that may this Brahmastra kill the Pandavas next generation. The generation that isn't born yet. And all of the Pandavas are upset upon hearing this. They say, you've done the same thing. You've just killed our next generation. Krishna Bhagwan says, as long as I'm here, this generation of yours and every generation that comes afterwards will always be safe. Now this story ends a little while later after the Mahabharata war is over. Arjun and his wife Uttara, they have a child by the name of Parikshit. But Parikshit is still born. He's born without any life in him. As soon as he's born in this way, Uttara, the mother, screams out to Krishna Bhagwan, Where is Krishna? Where is Krishna? Krishna Bhagwan arrives at the scene and Uttara gets angry at him. Uttara says that you promised that as long as you're on this earth, our next generation will always be safe. And here is our next generation. Here is my son. And he's dead. What will you do about it? Krishna Bhagwan, he looks at the boy, puts his hand on his chest, and he makes an affirmation. I'll say the entire affirmation first. Krishna Bhagwan, he says, Nokta Purvam Maya Mithya Nacha Yudde Paravrutaha Yatha Me Dahito Dharmo Brahmanas Chaiva Visheshataha Yatha Ham Nabi Janami Vijayena Kadachana Virodam Tena Satena Mruto Jivatvayam Shishuhu Yatha Kanshascha Keshicha Dharmena Nihato Maya Tena Satena Balo Yam Punar Ujjiva Tam Iha. If we look at each 
affirmation independently, individually. We'll see what Krishna Bhagwan is saying. Krishna Bhagwan is saying that if I have done A, B, C, D things in my life and I am pure in this way, may this child be reborn. The first thing he says is, Nokta Purvam Maya Mithya. If I have never lied in my life, may this child be reborn. From the very first statement, we know that this child should not be reborn. Krishna Bhagwan, in his life, he's lied many times. He's lied many times to help win in the war. Not only that, he's inspired other people like Yudhishthir to lie in the war. The second thing he says, Nache Yudhe Paravrata. If I have never run from battle, may this child be reborn. Krishna Bhagwan and Jarasand had a war at one point. And 17 different times, Krishna Bhagwan has run from this battle. He retreated. The third affirmation that Krishna Bhagwan gives, he says, Yatha me daito dharma. If I have always lived according to dharma, the ethics of the world, may this child be reborn. Now he's broken the rules of war to kill Duryodhan. He's broken the rules of war to kill Jarasan. And then Krishna Bhagwan even adds to it, Brahmanascha visheshataha. If I've always had a special place in my heart for Brahmins, and I've always cared for them specially, may this child be reborn. Now he's had Brahmins killed, like Dronacharya. He's had Ashwatthama cursed. And then Krishna Bhagwan continues. He says, Yathaham nabi janami vijayena kadachana virodham. If I have never gone against Arjun, if I have never argued against Arjun, may this child be reborn. The entire Srimad Bhagavad Gita is Krishna Bhagwan arguing with Arjun. And then he says, Yatha kanchascha keshi cha dharmena nihato maya. If I killed Kans and Keshi, According to the rules of war and according to the rules of battle, may this child be reborn. He killed both of them when they were already exhausted from previous fights. It wasn't a fair fight against either of them. Krishna Bhagwan says, if all of these things, not just one or two, if all of these things in my life are true, tena satyena, with this truth, may this boy, baloyam, punar utjivitam iha. Now, giving all of these different vows, if the boy was alive, he should have died. But we see the opposite. Krishna Bhagavan puts his hand on Parikshit's heart. After saying all of this, the boy comes back to life. This is proof that Krishna Bhagavan did all of these things and yet none of those things attached to him. He may have lied, but he wasn't a liar. He may have cheated in war, but he wasn't a cheater. How does this work? Because Krishna Bhagavan, everything he does is for a greater purpose. For example, if we go back into some of the things that he said, I mentioned the story of Jarasand. Jarasand was born to a king, Brahadrat. Brahadrat was married to the two twin daughters of the king of Kashi. When he was having children, both of the twin daughters gave birth to only half a child. King Brahadrat was so just vexed by seeing half a child from each mother, he was scared. He had both of them disposed of, both halves. And there was a demoness by the name of Jara. She found both halves of the boy and without thinking about it too much, she put the two of them together. And all of a sudden, the boy came to life. She took the boy back to the king. And the king was so overwhelmed with joy about seeing his son actually back to life that he named the child after the demon. Her name was Jara. And she was bound, tied. And Jara is the one who tied her, this boy back together. Jara Sand. Sand means to tie, to attach. Jarasand was born in this way. Now he was an evil king and he was actually Duryodhan's brother-in-law, married to Duryodhan's sister, Dushala. Jarasand had it in his mind that he wanted to wage war against Krishna Bhagwan in Dwarka. So he gathered dozens of evil other kings like himself to wage war against Krishna Bhagwan and to wage war against Dharma. And every time he would gather a large group of kings, he would invite Krishna Bhagwan to have a battle against him. Krishna Bhagwan would come. Krishna Bhagwan would destroy and kill every other king with his army. And then when it was the last moment, Jarasand versus Krishna, Krishna Bhagwan would go to fight him, turn around and run away. Not once, not twice, not 10 times, not 15. 17 times this happened. 17 times Krishna Bhagwan ran away from Jarasand. Now, from a worldly perspective, it seems that Krishna Bhagwan was afraid. But as we said previously, Kuntiji understands that Krishna Bhagwan is such that he's not afraid of anyone. In fact, fear is afraid of Krishna Bhagwan. So why would he run from Jarasand? When we look at it from the perspective of a devotee, someone who understands that Bhagwan is divine, we can see why Bhagwan did what he did. 
Bhagwan was actually being incredibly efficient. He let Jarasan gather all the other evil kings together. Then Bhagwan would go kill everyone else and leave Jarasan alive so that the second time he could gather another group of evil kings. And then Krishna Bhagwan would go a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a tenth time, fifteenth time. In this process, he let Jarasan gather everyone else who was evil. And Bhagwan every time would go and have everyone else killed with his army. Jarasan, in his mind, he thought that Krishna Bhagwan is afraid of me. After running away 17 different times, on the 18th time, on the 18th invitation, Krishna Bhagwan realized now it's time to kill Jarasan. He took Arjun and Bhim with him and they went disguised as Brahmins. At that time, when the three of them went to challenge Jarasan to a one-on-one battle, Jarasan saw them and he saw a mark on their shoulder. Adi Jya Lakshma Vibhushitaha. Adi Jya means bow, the string of a bow. Because Arjun, Krishna and Bhim were all warriors, for many years they must have carried a bow and arrow across their shoulders and backs. Now carrying a bow across his, on his shoulder, all three of them had a mark from it, Lakshma. And for a warrior, having this mark is like wearing jewelry, Vibhushitaha. They looked better for having it. Jarasan saw the mark and he realized that these aren't Brahmins, these are warriors. And he said, tell me who you truly are. Krishna Bhagwan, he said, I'm Krishna, this is Arjun and this is Bhim. Now the three of us are here, but we want to challenge you to a one-on-one battle. You choose which of the three of us you want to fight against. Jarasan said, Krishna, you've run away from me 17 different times, so I don't want to fight against you. And out of the three of you, if I had to choose one worthy opponent, I feel that my worthy opponent is Bhim. I want to fight against Bhim. Him and his mace versus me and my mace, Gada. The next morning, Bhim and Jarasan fought. They fought all day. But by the evening, neither of them had won. That evening, Jarasan sent various foods, various different supplies, everything that Bhim would need to recover happily at night. He had that sportsman spirit. The next day onwards, they would fight. During the day, they would fight. And in the evening, they would recover. Fight, recover, fight, recover. This continued for 15 days. 15 days later, Krishna Bhagwan went to Bhim. And he said, how long can we let this keep going? We need to finish this so we can get on to other tasks in our lives. Bhim said, I don't know how to beat him. Krishna Bhagwan said, I know how to do it, but it includes a little bit of cheating. Bhim said, I'm always happy to cheat. You tell me what we have to do. Krishna Bhagwan said, tomorrow when you're fighting, I'll whisper something in your ear at the right time. And when I tell you what to do, don't doubt it, just do it. Bhim said, fine. The next day they were fighting and there came a point in the battle where Bhim knocked Jarasand onto his back. Bhim had his knee on Jarasand's chest. Krishna Bhagwan from the side saw this and realized that this is the opportunity. He told Bhim, put your foot at his crotch, grab both of his legs and rip, rip his body down the middle. Bhim heard this and was shocked. Krishna Bhagwan said, don't look at me and do what I tell you. And in that very next instant, Bhim did exactly what he said. He ripped Jarasan's body into half. Krishna Bhagwan said, now you have both halves of his body in your hands, throw them in opposite directions. He threw both sides of the body into opposite directions. Bhim asked Krishna Bhagwan afterwards, why would you have me cheat in this type of terrible way? Krishna Bhagwan says, I am the only person here who understands how Jarasand was born. He was put together by this demoness by the name of Jara. Now, because he was put together in this way, if you had done anything else, he wouldn't have died. You had to rip him down the middle the same way he was put back together. Only Bhagwan knew. What seems like a dharma was actually the only dharma. Bhagwan Swaminarayan in the Vachnamrut, he makes a very impressive point where he says, that everything we see in God is not as we see it. We see childhood, we see young age, we see old age, we even see God pass away at times, but it's like a magician and his illusion. And at that time, Bhagwan Swaminarayan, in short, gives a story from the Vetal Pancha Vinchati. The Vetal Pancha Vinchati is a compilation of stories. Vetal means vampire. Pancha Vinchati means 25. These are 25 stories that a vampire told King Vikram Aditya. Now this is just a story. One time in Vikram Aditya, King Vikram Aditya's kingdom, a magician came. The magician said that currently 
The Devs and the Danavs, the gods and the demons are at war. They want your help, king, to win against the demons. The gods want your help. But if you go, it's at a risk of your life. So in your name, I'm ready to go and fight on the side of the gods. Will you give me permission? Now everyone realizes that this is just some sort of a drama. So the king and everyone else in the court, they say, go, go, go. And the magician took out a rope and he threw the rope into the air. And the rope stood straight. Everyone was shocked. The magician climbed the rope and he disappeared. And all of a sudden, everyone in the kingdom, they started hearing the sounds of battle. They started hearing what it would sound like when swords hit against shields. And then one by one, the magician's arm fell, the other arm, the leg, the body, and lastly, the magician's head fell to the ground. Everyone was shocked. The magician is dead. The magician is dead. And everyone is just silent. But one woman starts to scream. The magician's wife runs to her husband's dead body. She starts crying. She looks at the king and, and she says, My husband fought in your name. Do him the honor of being the one who burns his body, who does his cremation. The king is speechless. And so he agrees to the wife's condition. He has the people gather the magician's body. They leave the court. They go outside and they burn the body. And while the body is burning, the magician's wife goes to the king and she asks permission to become a sati, to sacrifice herself on the funeral pyre of her husband. The king gives her permission and she goes into the funeral pyre. And both the magician and the magician's wife burn in front of everyone. A few moments later, after the cremation, everyone returns back into the court. The rope is still there. They're confused as what to do about it. And then all of a sudden, the magician comes down from the rope. He tells the king, Dear king, I fought in your name and I helped the gods win the battle. Now, if you'll give me some gold to thank me for my hard work, I'll be on my way. The king is still speechless. And the king says, But, but I just burned you. Burn me. Here I am. The magician looks around and he says, Where's my wife? The king says, I just burned her as well. The magician is vexed. The magician says, King, this doesn't befit you. Why would you take my wife? I am just a poor magician. I have nobody else. You have many queens. Give me back my wife. The king says, I don't have your wife. He says, no, no, I'm sure you have my wife. And the magician calls out to his wife. And then from the balcony, the magician's wife comes out. She comes down the stairs and she stands next to her husband. Everyone is speechless and the magician and his wife both take a bow. The king is so impressed by their magic and their illusion, he grants them endless amounts of gold. Bhagwan Swaminarayan explains that everyone in the court, including the king and the ministers, everyone was speechless because they couldn't understand the maya of the magician. Everyone except one person, the magician's son. The magician's son knew that my father hasn't gone to the sky, my father hasn't died, my mother hasn't died, Nothing has happened. They've just gone somewhere else and this is all merely an illusion. In the same way, Bhagwan Swaminar, at the end of this Vachdamrut, he explains that Sri Krishna Bhagwan came onto this earth. He fought a war. After the war, he came home and his family passed away. He was upset. He passed away. And along with Krishna Bhagwan, all of the wives, Rukmini, etc., they all burned in the funeral pyre. Someone who's ignorant believes that Krishna Bhagwan came, Krishna Bhagwan saw, Krishna Bhagwan conquered and at the end Krishna Bhagwan died. But someone who's close to Krishna Bhagwan, someone who realizes, someone who's wise, they understand that Krishna Bhagwan was neither here nor there. Krishna Bhagwan did not leave from here. He's just gone somewhere else. This is what we understand when we have to understand divinity in God. Everything that they're seemingly doing is not the way that you and me do it. As Pramukh Swami Maharaj once said, you're sitting there and I'm sitting here, but there's a vast difference between both of us sitting. In the same way, Krishna Bhagavan can be sitting and we can be sitting, but there is a vast difference in the way that both of us are sitting. Lastly, when God says that He is divine, this does not give anyone else the right to say that they are divine. The only people who have a right to say that they are 100% divine and not bound by karma are the people who can give us similar fruits. As we saw in the 9th and 14th couplets first mentioned in this lecture, Krishna Bhagavan says that if you understand me as divine, then you yourself will also become divine. If you understand me as beyond karma, then you yourself will also move beyond karma, all attachment to karma. If by understanding someone as divine, 
we don't get the fruits of it, then understand that that person isn't the proper recipient for our divya bhav. In the same way, in conclusion for today's speech, I want to pray that we have found a true Guru, a true God, who are truly divine. Their janma and their karma are all divine. Understanding Bhagwan in this way, may we also become divine. Astu.